Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last installment of our summer Marshall Learning Lecture Series. Uh, today, Sebastian's going to be speaking to us a little bit of optimizing your experiments and which microscope is fun for you. So, uh, this is the, the last Marshall Learning for the summer. We're going to get started up again in the fall. Uh, the fall will be probably <coughs> we do a bit of a back to basics um, series, so just some introductions to microscopes and introductions to fluorescence. Uh, so we throw ahead just a few moments about that. And other than that, I don't think there's any other big announcements. Um, if anyone's a G1 or a G5 grad student, make sure you get your Simmons um, award applications in if you have this Friday, but next Friday. Uh, and that will get you some money to use the facilities during the year. Uh, if you applied in last year and got one this year, that's fine. You can apply again. Uh, there's no restrictions there. Okay. So with that, I will turn it over to Sebastian. Okay. Thanks, Doug, for this kind of introduction. Good question. Does everybody hear so the microphone working? Uh, the microscope, the microphone working. <laughs> Put it up a little higher, please. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Right, so thanks everyone um, for you to attend this uh, last discussion of our series. The topic is um, optimal imaging for rest microscopy, how to optimize your settings in our glass sensor. And let's start with the question what optimal, uh, optimal imaging actually means? And I will ask you that question, I guess most of you would give me a slightly different answer. Um, because all of the different ideas on how to optimize um, the imaging. When I actually faced that question, preparing this lecture, I was thinking back um, to my application form that I submitted to Carl Zeiss for almost two and a half years ago. <coughs> and there was my first sentence, and I guess it would be a little bit different if I apply to the United States, but in Germany, we should always kind of start an application with an introductory sentence. And my introductory sentence was actually that I see modern microscopy as a question for the optimal compromise to view light quanta derived from a biological, physical, or chemical sample. So basically, I interpret optimal imaging as a quest for a compromise. And a compromise usually goes along with multiple ways to reach that. So in German, we have the saying, um, Peter Dege für nach Rom. So there are many ways leading to Rome. I don't know the similar expression in English. However, if you have many ways reaching a target, there are always also trade-offs, meaning that there are some sacrifices. We will talk about these kind of sacrifices in order to reach um, optimal imaging depending on your specific application. And there are multiple parameters that you can actually optimize when it comes to the question how to optimize your image. And that can be subdivided into four main groups. The imaging system itself, consisting of the hardware components, the microscope, the filters, objectives, your through force and the detectors the actual software parameters, so the imaging parameters, and the image processing parameters, um, how to process your image, how to analyze your image, how to document it, present it, um, store it in an efficient way, and last but not least, the sample. And I would actually like to talk about the sample in the beginning because that is something that is often neglected. Mostly um, people rely on specific um, sample preparation protocol that was established in your lab maybe half a year, one year, two years ago, where some nice applications done with that. So people just take the protocol for granted and um, let's put it in a critical way, they consider a certain protocol as a holy grail. Right? So you would not really touch that and modify that. Um, however, sometimes you also have to take a step back and think about that take home message that I would like to pass on as the first take home message of today. If you have non-optimal input, so maybe just a bad input, and if you use a very good microscope system, or if you want to use a very, very good microscope system, even with a super resolution like our Ariscan system, what you're mostly not getting is a good image. You will rather end up with a bad image. So keep in mind, this is the first day commentary which I would like um, to pass on to you, that only if you have a good input, a good microscope system will help you to generate also good if your input is not good, if your sample preparation is not optimized, um, then even the best microscope system will not help you to get the best out of your image. So some um, arguments or some, um, some comments, which are actually self-evident, but as I told you, many people consider protocol as a holy grail, so 
and maybe not questioned that much, is um, if you do a separate preparation, think about whether they are accurate and thorough enough. And when it comes to the stainings, and this is something even more important, reconsider whether there are new and more specific stains, more specific antibodies out on the market that give you a more specific signal. Right? And when it comes to washing any kind of stains, for instance, antibodies, also always keep in mind, don't save time on the washing procedure. Because it takes very, sometimes it takes one or two days for the antibody to reach um, the antigen target site. So keep in mind that it takes at least the same amount of time, even, uh, even longer, to get antibody that didn't bind to your specific target out from your cell again, to lower the background. Most people that image, they complain that the background is so high, so that the signal to background ratio is not optimal. And that's something that you cannot really optimize on microscope systems. You, you can try to tweak some parameters, but it's actually the washing step. So as I said, they want the bad thing that's protocol um, that should be optimized in order to optimize your image output. When you mount your sample, be careful, use the right mounting media, um, don't apply too much of that because you will have some dispersion of the light the amount of the amount of, um, the amount of the mounting media is, is too high. And also when you mount your, um, your sample in a certain dish, if the thickness of your of your glass of your dish is too high, you also have much more light dispersion and you're not getting so many photons back from the sample. So as I told you, so this is mostly considered a holy grail. So let's say um, the ground is actually do not want to touch and do not want to enter, but please also reconsider that when you um, want to optimize your image. Okay, now let's move, um, move on to um, the first, um, the first uh, let's say optimization parameter that I can I can actually talk about on the field of protocol, and that's the question which microscope to choose in order to optimize the image. In our imaging facility, we have different kind of microscope systems. We have confocal-related scanning microscope systems, white field microscope systems, two-photon system, light sheet, and axial systems. And all of these different systems, they have different advantages. Depending on which advantage you actually want to want to have, want to receive, and you have to pick one of these different microscope systems. So the confocal-laser scanning microscope systems are usually picked by most of you guys because they are key to use for focal systems and if you consider the error scan system, they even provide you with some super resolution. So some resolution is below the um, diffraction of light, uh, of light. However, if you have an application that, is, uh, that requires fast imaging, maybe wide field system would be better suitable for you because the camera-based system is usually much faster. The photon system is used if you want to um, apply gentle and deep imaging. Light sheet um, should be used if you do some whole tissue imaging um, and when you want to be very fast and sensitive, so we have some reaching issues. And if you want to observe um, a very large specimen, a very large sample, and you also want to um, turn that sample with forceps, you would need to have a microscope that provides you with a large working distance with a large field of view. So for that purpose, an facility would provide you with the axial microscope. Let's talk a little bit about the objective, and actually only a little bit, because some of you already attended a lecture given by me about four weeks ago, and you can read up much about microscope objectives. You go onto our web page and take a look at this presentation. The only thing that I would like to mention is that the selection criteria for you um, with respect to the objectives should be based on the magnification and resolution that you want to have, the light gathering power that you need, a color correction in case you work with multiple colors and you want to do some color polarization studies. Um, pay attention to the wavelength transmission efficiency and large field of view, large working distance in case you want to capture a large area um, of your sample. And basically, all that kind of information right, you can find out on our site's um, homepage where we have some objective um, say, guideline or guide that you can just look up and try to see what parameters you have. Okay, move on to the next topic, filter settings and fluophores, or chromophores. The take home message that I would like to pass on to you with respect to that, and this is a really crucial is, please know your dyes. Know the excitation and the emission spectra of the dyes that you actually apply for your staining, for your um, protein expression. Because only when you know these, uh, these properties, the spectral properties, you can get some information about 
where you can answer the question whether you actually have the appropriate light source on a specific microscope system to illuminate the dice and get um, strong signal um, back from your from your from the stainings. Another question that you can also answer once you know the excitation emission spectra is whether the detection range of your microscope system, no matter whether it's a filter-based system or whether it's um, the spectral range on a focal laser scanning microscope system, is actually suitable for the dyes that you want to image. And the last question, um, the very important question is, would it have some spectral overlap if you have two, three, or four dyes um, in, your, um, in your sample? And the topic that I would like to talk about now is a topic called crosstalk. Let's consider the following example. Let's consider we have um, staining, any kind of sample, where we have an Alexa 488 dye and an Alexa 546 dye. And we work on a microscope system which provides us with a 488 and a 561 laser. What you already see with respect to the excitation spectra and the, and the laser lines is that you actually don't have any excitation crosstalk. So each of the different laser lines is only exciting one particular dye. However, when it comes to the emission spectrum of these um, two dyes, you see that there is some emission crosstalk. So there is some overlap with respect um, to the emission, to the signal that is coming back from the sample. So if you would um, image um, sample or kind of cells that are stained with Alexa 48 and Alexa 561 um, simultaneously and would merge the image would be very happy, the supervisor would be very happy and interpret that result as some um, co-localization, right? Because you have a nice um, yellow signal. However, that would be a wrong interpretation because of that overlap. Which you are now probably well because you now considered the excitation and emission spectrum of your lines. So for this kind of dye um, combination, what you should rather use on, on a microscope system is a sequential scan, meaning that you first acquire um, the signal from the Alexa 48 and then from the Alexa 546. When you then merge the image, you will actually see that there's no localization of both signals. Right? So you will make the right a judgment with respect to full localization of two problems of interest. So when you do sequential imaging, as I told you, um, a positive effect is that you effectively eliminate emission crosstalk. Um, and due to the fact that you can actually use long pass filters instead of bad pass filters that cut off your emission spectrum, um, you have an improved signal to noise ratio. However, big disadvantage is it's a very time consuming process to do the sequential scan, especially if you consider you want to do these stack, you have three, four, five colors. It takes very long. So what can you do? <coughs> There's one method that is called linear unmixing. And this method was originally developed to separate dyes with overlapping emission or excitation spectrum. The example that I now want to talk about is an example where you have double stain or a double stain where you have GFD and YFD. So the way how you do that, and I will go into more details, is we use the lambda mode in the imaging setup on the focal system. Um, acquire your data and then later on apply a linear unmixing algorithm on your data um, to separate two different populations of cells from each other. Not very easy, and basically it is very easy. So I just go, I go through, through the um, crucial ones that have stopped with the arm mixing on the microscope system in case you have um, problems with spectral overlap. First issue is that you should prepare your sample with your multiple um, dikes, right? So what you normally do is we have your, your protocol, you put in this case two um, antibodies on it, um, and you get the result. However, what you should do, and this is this is the catch when it comes to linear unmixing, um, also compare samples with the same protocol where you only use one dye, right? Or you, where you only have one type of cell expressing one um, fluorescent protein, for instance, GFP and YFP. Once you have that, um, use the multiple stain sample, go to the lambda mode in your imaging setup, and image it. You will get this image where you have the overlap of um, we have, yeah, we will have the overlap of all different cellular populations. That's actually the step where most people come to us and say, oh, how can I actually separate my two different um, cell populations because I have some spectral overlap. And then we would come back and tell you, okay, you need to prepare some samples where you only have one left for the same protocol. And the best, of course, would be to prepare it at the same time because there are always some slight variations and uh, consider the volume of different chemicals when you treat the sample. So always do that. Um, 
um, simultaneously. Right, so the next step is actually use the same imaging settings that you used for the multiple stain sample imaging and apply them to image your single stain samples. So you will get some reference images, G, P, and Y at the outset. Afterwards, just by clicking, uh, I think, two or three times on some buttons in our sense software, extract your reference vector. And once you've extracted the reference vector, you have the, the respective curves for G, P, and Y, P. You can use the spectra for unmixing. And it works in the way that the linear unmixing algorithm is searching for the relative contribution from each individual spectrum until the sum equals the combined emission spectrum. Um, so basically, the linear unmixing algorithm is completed when the relative contributions from each reference spectrum adds up to the measured spectrum that you receive from the double state. The nice thing is you can separate dyes with overlap spectra, emission excitation spectra, or for instance, you can also separate fluorescent labels from autofluorescent. Next topic that I would like to start is um, detector and imaging parameters. And this whole topic is actually um, quite, um, quite related to each other. Um, I kind of combine them within the next couple of slides. So, Let's first talk a little bit about the detectors. The first thing that you should know is that we have two different kind of, or two different families of detectors in our imaging facilities, cameras and photomultiplier tools, abbreviated PMTs. Cameras, CCD cameras, EM CCD cameras, and SDMOS cameras. So there are ones that we have in our facility. When it comes to PMTs, we have photomultiplier tools that are made of multi-alkali elements or gallium um, acetate phosphide. Take home message um, that I would already like to pass on with respect to detectors is that they have a different work principle, and I will point them out in a second. And they have different efficiencies converting photons into some electronic signal that you detect and that you then later on see on the screen. And these efficiencies, they are lambda dependent. And that's the catch here, that, that's the main information that you should remember when you, when you read that room later on. And these questions, uh, these, um, let's say the information that we'll pass on to you in the next couple of slides, they will actually help you also to answer the questions um, which kind of system you should use um, depending on the speed um, and depending on the need to be efficient um, collecting a certain amount of photons in case you have a very easy signal. Let's start with the camera technology. Um, in principle, all cameras uh, or camera chip work, work the same way. So you have a light sensitive um, silicon chip where you have some silicon oxide matter on the surface facing towards um, the light that falls on the chip. Um, and once photons fall onto the silicon oxide matter, electrons are being generated, um, kind of released from the silicon oxide matter, um, which are proportional to the light intensity of the incident light that falls onto the, the camera chip. And the charges that are generated, they are subsequently read out and converted into a digital signal being displayed as intensity values in this computer. So that's basically how camera works. What you have to know, and I've already told you that um, the work principle is, um, is wavelength dependent, is that depending on the camera that you use, you have different kind of um, camera chips. And most of the chips that we actually have in a uh, microscopy uh, on different microscope systems, independent of the producer of the camera or of the microscope system, they actually rely on these big companies that mainly produce these kind of chips for, for smartphones. Right? Um, so it's not a real business for these big companies like Sony or Samsung or Kodak to produce camera chips only for microscope cameras because the, the amount of cameras for microscope systems is too small. So microscope companies, they try to look at these parameters and they ask Sony, the sector or Kodak to deliver some of these chips and uh, we can prove them. So, let's talk about one big parameter that, is, that can be applied um, in camera technology and also in photomultiplier technology, which is quantum efficiency. Quantum efficiency actually tells you how good the detector can convert photons into electrons. And it's given usually as a percentage value, meaning 100% um, that photon, if the single photon is converted into one electron. The coefficient of 50% means that two photons are converted into one electron. 
And what you see on the, um, on the figure on the right is that the different chips that you can use in your cameras, um, they're kind of wavelength dependent with respect to their quantum efficiency. And all of these chips, they share the uh, common feature that the maximum quantum efficiency is always in the green-yellow spectral range. And that the conversion ability is very low when it comes to um, bluish light, or UV light, and when it comes to far red light. Right, so this is the main property that you always have to keep in mind. So if you want to image, if you have a very dim, um, and let's say a very dim, let's say stain, right? Rather put that uh, dim stain um, somewhere in the, um, in the green yellow range and not in the red or the blue range because the detector is not able to see that very well. So you would have to use very high laser power, very high, high gain in order to see that then you would find the more and more and more and more in your image. So for dim signals, go for um, green or yellow um, spectra because that would provide you with much better quantum efficiency on your camera or on your PFT um, surface. Also keep in mind that um, when you use a color camera, for instance, because you don't have another choice in your lab whatsoever, the quantum efficiency in color cameras always reduced comparing it to a black and white camera. So the black light indicating the quantum efficiency of a black and white camera and the three color traces of a color camera. Because color camera is nothing else than a black and white camera with a color field in front of it. Any kind of filter or glass that you put in front of a light sensitive surface just absorbs some light. And therefore, um, less photos will reach the photosensitive surface to be converted to electrons. Okay. An um, important parameter when it comes to camera technology, and especially if you have a thin signal, is binning. I don't know how many people are aware of that term, or could explain what that means. Binning actually means that you combine accumulated electrons of adjacent horizontal and vertical pixels of a camera chip. So normally, um, any kind of camera chip is built up um, a different picture on chip elements or pixels. Right? Pixels have more than an abbreviation of picture elements, like right? in this case, chip elements. And when you apply some binning that you can easily do in the software, you are actually combining the light information or the electron information, so once the photos were converted to electrons, of adjacent pixels. So if I have a binning of two by two, um, my image, the image information comes from all of these four pixels. And the advantage of doing that on the system is, as I told you already, to increase your signal, in case you have a thin sample, so you get brighter images. And the nice thing is you can reduce your exposure time and also reduce your bleaching, in case you're facing some bleaching issues. Another advantage is that if you have a lower number of pixels, you have a faster readout and you can increase your temporal resolution in your, in your imaging. Other nice advantages, you reduce your flight size because you have a lower number of pixels. So you're much faster with respect to image processing that you already use in the any other kind of image processing software. However, there's also trade-off. As I told you, it's all about optimizing your image. It's always kind of a compromise. So the compromise in this case is that if you lower the amount of pixels, you of course also lower your spatial resolution. However, it's a question whether you really lose information when you lower the amount of pixels and have a lower spatial resolution. Because it could be that your primary target, your primary goal in your imaging experiments is not to have the best spatial resolution, but, for instance, to have a very high uh, temporal resolution. Right, so maybe you want to speed up your experiment and you want to go to up to maybe 500, 1,000 frames per second. Because you want to see, let's say, some calcium spikes in some cells, so you're maybe not only interested in to see an event or not see an event. So your primary focus is not the spatial resolution, but it's rather the time issue. Right? So that could be one experiment where binning might be useful. However, in case you're not satisfied with what I just told you, and say, no, I actually I want to have want to keep a high spatial resolution, but I want to also increase my, my temporal resolution. I turn to strategy between to apply so-called subframes. What does subframes mean? Most often when you image some samples, um, you actually don't need to image the whole part of your field of view that the objective is providing you. Usually you're mostly also satisfied with a specific part of the image where the interesting um, events are going on. Maybe not for your poster, maybe not for the first figure of your paper. Therefore, you would need to have the whole image. But for the data collection for your um, image analysis, for your event analysis, it's maybe sufficient to only read out a small part of your, um, of your sample and only 
value at that advantages. If you, have, if you only read out a small part of your sample, um, the camera can do that much faster, so you have, can achieve higher frame rates. And, last thing again, you save space on your hard drive in case you do long-term experiments and also time when you do your processing. And the subsetting does not only hold true for camera-based images, um, but also for photo-image higher true-based images and focal systems where you know that you can apply zoos, right? Just think about it. Reduce your file size because you often run the situation that you have to buy a couple of storage drives before you finish your a certain project. You can even reduce that and be more efficient in data and image processing when you just crop a certain part of the image and only focus on it. <coughs> okay, now I would like to talk about the photo multiplier um, tubes. And I told you already that we can subdivide them into the multi alkaline um, tubes and the carbon um, arsenide phosphide. Um, let's talk a little bit about the principle how photomultiplier tubes work. So, a um, photomultiplier tube has a photocathode. And on this photocathode, there's the same thing going on as in the silicon oxide method of the cathode chip. Um, photons are converted into electrons. The only difference is that this is not made out of silicon oxide, but either made out of multi alkali elements or calcium arsenide phosphide elements. Right? That's the difference. And the gallium acid phosphide or multi alkylate elements, they interact with the incoming photons and they will generate electrons. And the electrons that are generated um, on their photocathode, um, they're kind of attracted and accelerated to dynodes, which are in the photomultiplier tube. Because the dynodes are slightly positively charged and thereby attract the electron. And once the electron accelerates and hits the surface of the dynode, um, additional electrons are generated and they will immediately fly on or fly to the next dynode because this is a sequence dynode is a little bit more positive than the previous one. And during this flight, um, the electrons are multiplied. And at the anode, the signal is spread out and via some converter, uh, converted into a digital signal to the center of the screen. Um, If you would live in an ideal world, a photomultiplier tube, um, which by the way, I think from a technological perspective is a wrong name, because actually it's an electromultiplier tube, um, we would have a sample um, that gives us very many photons. And our photomultiplier tube doesn't really need to amplify the signal because by the photoelectric effect on the photo cutout, we already generate a high amount of electrons that will produce a very high signal um, on level of the anode. However, unfortunately we are not living in an ideal world, um, so we usually have some samples which are not very bright, or which are not super bright, and they only give us a limited amount of photons. So what we actually have to do is, in order to get a very bright signal, what you also do when you're sitting in front of the confocal microscope is, you're increasing the gain. Right? What you basically do is you increase the voltage difference, the differences between the different diamonds so that the acceleration of the electrons is facilitated and you increase the amount of electrons that are generated on the surface of these dynamics. And by that, the signal becomes brighter, or the image will become brighter. However, keep in mind that there's always also an optimal working range of the detector, because if you set up the gain too high, right, and I would always say it depends on the system you're working on and the age of the detector, um, you will generate additional electrons that were not generated, that were, that were not derived from the photons that um, hit the photocathode. And this is basically represented as some noise in your image, some detector noise that you want to get rid of. So when we talk about the two different photomultiplier tubes that we have in our facility, GASP and the multi PMT tubes, um, with respect to their quantum efficiency again, so their ability to convert photons into electrons, we also find that there is some Wavelength dependency. With respect to the gas detector, we have the best, or we have a better photo um, conversion ability um, comparing it to the multi alkali detector in the range from 420 nanometers to 710 nanometers. The multi alkali, they all perform the gas detectors when it comes to wavelengths um, below 420 and above 710. And by the way, also keep in mind, probably some of you already discovered that on that slide, 
that the quantum efficiency or the quantum efficiency of gas with the detector is usually much lower than the camera. The camera provides you with a much higher quantum efficiency, up to 90%. And on a component system, the two different detectors, they only reach about 0.45%. And by the way, from, det from detector to a, from one detector generation to the next detector generation, if you buy the next component microscope system, or if you go to a more recent component microscope system, so for instance, from uh, 710, to an 780 to an 880 system, this quantum efficiency is actually a major change. So the technology that is provided by the big companies like Sony or Coca has improved, and that's the reason for what you can find um, new um, detector surfaces for kind of detectors which have a uh, more recent um, photocarbon surface. Okay, nonetheless, so we have different sensitivities, different wavelength um, sensitivities uh, with two detectors. Um, so the way how actually NICE makes use of these different um, different sensitivities is that we have a detector unit called Kazan detector, um, where we have a central gas detector, which is flanked by two multi-alkali detectors. It's the left and right of the gas detector. And what you can actually do the software very easily by moving the small spiders that you're probably all aware of. Now, is that you can move some prism into the light path and project, for instance, red light and blue light on multi alkali detectors. And the reason why you can do that, or you can do that, I guess all of you can answer that question right now, is because for the red light and for the blue light, these multi alkali detectors, they are more sensitive than the gas detector. Right, so you need a lower laser power, a lower gain, and to get a better signal if you use these multi alkali detectors for um, infrared or for far red and for UV light detection. So when it comes to setting up um, your, uh, your imaging tracks and you image some UV dye or you image some infrared dye together um, with some green or yellow dye, um, make sure that you use all of the different detectors, right? Because the channel one detector that is one PMT on the left side detecting the blue light, the channel two detector with a multi alkaline PMT signal on the right side. Um, they have a better quantum efficiency in these different detector ranges than the channel S and S as a spectrum detector, which um, is more or less nothing less than the gas detector. And by that you kind of optimize your um, the signal output. The next topic I would like to talk about is the dynamic range. And I would like to talk about the two dynamic ranges that you find in our software, which is on one hand the dynamic range of the display curve. So display icon is found below the image. And the dynamic range of the detectors itself. And when I talk about the dynamic range of the detector, then the images that I show you are derived from the control system. Um, but this actually also holds true for the wide field camera lenses. Okay, so let's first talk about the dynamic range of the display curve. So what does the display curve actually mean when you take a look at it? Basically, it's a histogram that shows you the distribution of the pixel intensity values in the image. When you think of a fluorescent image, um, most of the pixels that you see in your image are black. Right, so they have a low intensity value. Therefore, in fluorescent microscopy, you will see a strong peak on the left part of the curve. If you do some bright field imaging, this curve will look completely different. You will have many volumes on the right side and only some volumes on the left. Most people use the so called Minmax function. Um, and what this Minmax function actually does is it adjusts the data display or the image display um, from the lowest to the brightest signal that was detected. Because the detector usually has long working range in which it can detect um, your signal, but make your signal not strong enough. So what you can do by just hitting this max button, you can um, kind of shift this curve in the way that you only display the lowest or from the lowest to the brightest signal that was detected by your camera or by your photometer image. Keep in mind because many people actually are stuck in me, um, is um, whether this min-max button actually changes my original data. And we 
uh, answer to that is it doesn't change your original data. So it only changes the display of your data. So the original data is still kept, and if you open your data file, image data, et cetera, everything is as it should be, right? So we don't have to try to fuse this in the months, but then later on, um, to validate your data and image data. <coughs> now let's talk a little bit about the dynamic range of the detector. Um, and you get a very nice view on the dynamic range of the detector or the dynamic range um, of your signal if you go to the profile tab, which is in the left tab area next to your image. Um, um, and just draw a profile line through your, um, through your image, so through some structures of interest. Um, and what you actually see is you will see, your you will see your signal being displayed also in the histogram. And this histogram, as I told you, reflects um, how much of the dynamic range of the detector is used. And to clarify what dynamic range of the detector actually means, it is nothing else than the working range um, of the detector between the lowest signal that the detector can detect and the brightest signal before the detector is saturated. Um, and when it comes to a situation where you will encounter some issues um, evaluating your data, um, where you want to improve um, the discrimination between different intensity values because you have some cells that express your protein of interest in a much stronger way than another and you have difficulties in evaluating um, to what extent this could be one solution um, to improve the discrimination um, between these different conditions is to make use of the full dynamic range of the detector right? because you have more intensity values um, being detected and then you get a better differentiation between stronger signals and um, lower signals. Right, and how to do that? Basically, um, what you need to do is you need to collect more signal on your detector. And you can do that by either increasing the gain, laser power, or sacrificing some spatial resolution and open the gimbal. Or you can also increase the exposure time, just collect more photons in order to get much better signal. However, Always keep in mind that you can also oversaturate your detector if you um, kind of increase these parameters too much. And if you have, have oversaturation in some parts of your image, these pixels cannot be used for some quantitative evaluation, right? Because you don't know how large the signal um, is, is um, in that particular pixel. It could be going up to here, but it could also stop over here. So that's something that you cannot use for your data evaluation. So, We've implemented something that is very nice and easy to use, um, which you find under the dimension tabs. And this is so called range indicator box. Once you check this range indicator box, um, the image will kind of change um, to, uh, to, let's say, black and white. And pixels that would be oversaturated, they will appear red. So you immediately see, looking at the image, whether you have some oversaturated pixels in the image. So Nice thing is that you can now only go to your main settings like gain, laser, or exposure time, introduce them, um, and just see whether the red pixels that you see in your image disappear. And once they kind of disappear, you know you're just below the, um, um, the highest signal that can be detected by the detector, so you are losing most of the working range of the detector. Right? So it's a very easy way how to ensure that you use the full working range of However, also keep in mind, uh, just an educational note, if you, for instance, have some regions, either in your cell or in your sample, which is just an antibody or dye accumulation, which is completely unspecific, of course, you don't need to kind of reduce the gain at the laser so that this area, for instance, also um, doesn't show you any oversaturated pixels. Focus on the regions that you want to evaluate and make sure that you use the full working range for these particular regions. Talk a little bit about the noise and how you can actually reduce the noise. Um, some information I passed already on to you. If you set your gain too high, you will have some unspecific electrons being generated within the detector itself um, that will reduce some noise. So you can just reduce the gain, increase its quality, or increase the laser power in order to um, not have detector based um, noise in your image. However, there are some other strategies as well. For instance, something that I already mentioned, longer exposure time. If you increase the exposure time, that you can, what you can actually do in the um, transition tab um, on your speed, um, you actually not only um, collect more signal from the image, but also less, less noise. 
because the noise that you see in the image is usually represented as a so-called signal-to-noise ratio. So signal over noise. Right? If you collect more signal because you have a large exposure time, the noise that is generated by the optical system more or less stays constant. So the signal-to-noise ratio would change. And if you just take a look at these images, which were acquired of different things that were cut, you see the image becomes more crisp and less noisy. However, trade-off, sacrifice, temporal resolution. So it's a time consuming process. Okay. What could be an alternative strategy? Alternative strategy could be um, to use a method that is called averaging. Averaging actually means that you acquire your image a couple of times and then just average um, the values, the intensity values um, of your individual pixels. Because noise in an image is usually um, a stochastic variable, which could be positive, which could also be negative. So by acquiring positive and negative values and then just creating a mean, quite often they cancel out each other right? to reduce um, the noise in the image. And the averaging tab can be found um, also in the acquisition mode tab down here. If you hit the show all button, you will get some additional parameters regarding averaging because in total, uh, Zeiss is providing you with four different models for averaging, um, line and frame averaging, which you find over here, and mean averaging and maximum, um, which you find under the method section. What does it mean? Um, frame averaging, let's start with the one that actually everyone should use if you work with um, fixed samples, um, is a, or well, can actually be used if you work with fixed samples, um, is a way that you record an image and you record a second image after the first image was, was recorded. Take the intensity, fixed intensity values and create um, either a mean or a maximum. What that means, I will talk about in a second. If you set your averaging to line scanning, which is, by the way, the default setting, right? so if you don't change it, it will always be line setting. This line setting is actually something that, is, that should be used for people that work with living cells. The laser um, goes over a certain line in your image. So the way how the, how the control system works, I think it's familiar to all of you, it's a line scanning system. Well, not a line scanning system, but the, um, the point uh, scanner. The points are acquired along a line, and then the next line is acquired. That's the way how a control system actually acquires the data. Form. And if you set the mode to a line, or the mode is set to a line, then the first line is acquired, and then the same line is acquired again, again, and again, depending on the number of averaging cycles that you set in the software. So in case you work with fluid force that um, reach very fast, right? You are sometimes, depending on the speed, not giving enough time for the fluid force to recover. So if you do some averaging, if you do some line-wise averaging, you might end up in a situation that after, for instance, the fourth scan, you've reached already your fluid force to a very high extent. So if you do some averaging of that, um, you will not optimize your image quality. So if you have some bleaching issues, go to the show all, button or hit the show all button and change the mode from line to frame. Right? Because then you will first scan the whole image and then start again and scan the whole image again. Line averaging is important if you do nice cell imaging, as I already told, because it could be that something moves in itself, for instance, a small vesicle. And if you wait for one second and go back and image the same spot again, you miss the vesicle and it moves a couple of micrometers already. And the imaging result is not really useful. Right, what does mean and maximum um, averaging actually mean? So mean averaging is the, um, is the default setting. Um, it just creates a mean um, of, let's say, the pixel intensity values that you collected. Um, maximum uh, will just give you the maximum pixel intensity values from a certain amount of images that were required depending on the number of averages. So most commonly, I would suggest to change mode to frame because most people that sit on the control system, they work um, they work with fixed samples. Sacrifice a little bit of time if you go to frame and go to line wise averaging. But I guess um, as photo bleaching is more, usually a more important issue than the time, um, I would recommend to go to frame and as a method use the default setting that is needed. Okay, so if you do some averaging, for instance, set it to frame and mean, um, you immediately see that the image is also less noisy and more crisp. However, again, it's the same con, it's time for you, it's a time consuming. But the images a few more nice. And I would actually say, depending on for what purpose you actually require the images, mostly you're not so much interested in having the best spatial resolution, 
Sometimes you're just interested in getting some impression from certain structures where certain um, proteins are, for instance, expressed, or to see a certain um, life set signal. Um, then for the front page of, um, of Nature, or for the first figure in your presentation, um, you can take one image with a very high averaging factor, but maybe you don't have to use eight times averaging every time you require the image. Maybe one or two times averaging is good enough. Okay, next topic I would like to talk about is bit depth. <coughs> bit depth is a parameter that can also be found in the acquisition mode tab just next to the averaging tab. And most people um, that sit in front of a the microscope, they also don't really touch their button, they just need to play with it. And I will tell you um, why that sometimes makes sense, but why quite often um, it will not lead to an optimal image. Bit depth actually describes into how many shades of gray the detector compartmentalizes the signal for the image display. That's a very easy explanation what bit depth means. However, to understand, I actually um, created this one example. So let's just assume the, the following Gedanken experiment, Ford experiment, that the detector has a maximum detection capability of 25,000 photons. So if you have 26,000 photons, the detector is oversaturated. So let's assume we have a detector that can detect up to 25,000 photons. One of the inherent properties of the detector is that it has a so-called analog digital converter. Um, and this analog digital converter is, as it would in the software, for instance, set to 8-bit. 8-bit means 2 to the power of 8, 256. What does it well mean? This value means that in your image, intensity values will be displayed by up to 256 um, shades of gray. If you now take um, 25,000 photons that our detector can collect, these 25,000 photons are now subdivided into these 256 different segments. Because you told, this, you told the system to create 256 different or seconds, right? That means that the image that's generated, every gray level that you have in the image, represents a multitude of about 98 photons. Okay. And here's the catch. Considering the content of one gray level, whether you have 10, 20, or 90 photons, or multitudes of that, it will be represented as the same gray level. If you use your data now and do some image processing with your data, the image state will not see a difference whether it's 10, 20, or 90 volts because it's one, one gray level, right? Let's now move on to a situation where you set the LED converter to 16 bit. 16 bit, 2 to the power 16, 65,000 um, gray values into which the image intensity values will be kind of split or compartmented. That means if you take the same detector, 25,000 photons, these 25,000 photons will be subdivided into 65,000 different segments. That means that every gray level that you have in the image represents multitudes of 0.4 photons. By the way, our eyes will not be able to detect that right? because our eyes are only 256 bit um, detectors, right? But it's stored as if every gray value um, and represent a multitude of 0 0.4 photons. That means that ImageJ or any kind of other software can now detect signal differences on a single photon level. Right? Before that was not possible, because before you had increments of 98 photons. And now we have increments of 0 0.4 photons. So, bit depth actually means that if you have a high bit depth, you can better differentiate um, certain, let's say, expression differences or sort of protein or staining differences in your image if you do some image processing afterwards. So it's useful if you have small signal differences when you compare different conditions, different tissues with each other, um, because you need to acquire a layers experiment to find significant differences for your final figure. Right, so that's a quick advantage. Because you don't need to expect or you need to you don't need to have, let's say, 100n equals 100 to see some difference, or to, or to have some condition where you have a huge difference. So also small differences can now be detected using the higher bit depth. 
either the big trade-off, as I said, it's always about trade-offs actually in this lecture, so it's nothing really optimal. Um, so if you set your detector to 16-bit, you generate much larger data points compared to 8-bit, and you have to have a much larger data set. It also takes longer to process your images. However, you need to um, acquire less experience in total. Right? So it's kind of a trade-off. You have to think of what options work with less experiments and sit long in front of my computer or of course everything is more or less optimized right now um, with respect to image processing. Um, we just wait until the computer finishes. Last um, topic that I would like to bring up is how to optimize, how to easily optimize the resolution of a control system. And actually it's a very a very simple simple trick, but when I take a look at um, many people sitting on the microscope systems, I often see that um, people are not really aware of how you can easily increase the resolution of the system. So many people just complain, okay, or say, oh, the resolution is not good enough, let's change to 63x objective or 100x objective to improve your resolution, which is, by the way, not a bad idea, because usually these objectives provide you a much higher picture, but there is a much easier way in case you want to keep a, a large field of view, still using for instance, a 20 x or so, as I told you, I most often see when you take a look at the acquisition mode here, that people just leave the frame size setting, or just have a frame size setting, um, at 512 times 512. Meaning that the laser beam and the scanners, um, they are kind of adjusted in the way that your, that your image will represent 512, or will be represented by 512 by 512 pixels. And that is also the resolution that you have. So you have a 500 times 512 pixel large image. <coughs> However, the setting 512 times 512 is the default setting of the Zen software. It is not the optimal setting of the Zen software. Depending on the objective and the scan area or the subframe, so depending on the objective that you choose or the zoom that you have, it's considered a confocal system, um, the system, so the optical system, can provide you with a much higher resolution than with only 512 by 512. And the only thing that you actually have to do is you have to take the small optimal button that is below the frame size numbers. Okay. So once you do that, um, for instance, with a 63x objective, you hit that button before you click the button Start Experiment. The system will adjust itself to the maximal useful number of pixels depending on the um, objective and the, and, uh, and the zoom rate. And if you do that, for instance, with a 63x objective, you will increase your spatial resolution by a factor of 10 already, which you can never achieve if you now change to a 100 x objective, which gives you a slightly higher um, spatial resolution because of a slightly higher numeric temperature. And to compress you further, if you consider a 20 x objective and hitting the optimal button, you increase your spatial resolution already by a factor of 30. Only by hitting that button. However, the trade off, of course, is the total scan time. Right? The total scan time is also increased by a factor of 30 because you scan more a higher amount of pixels. But you increase your spatial resolution dramatically only by hitting that button. So the last take home message um, that I would like to um, give you today is sometimes optimization is only one click away. And by that I would like to conclude um, and say thank you for your Last line, you said that by taking the optimal button, you change the resolution, but it seems to me it's changing the field of view and not the... No, the field of view is not changed. The field of view stays constant, and therefore it kind of generates more pixels throughout this field of view, and therefore also the scan time increases. So you split the circle image, the circle image size, into smaller elements. And so the size of the image stays the same. Only the pixel elements, or the individual elements, they become smaller. So it's changing the pin name effectively? Um, it's not a real thing. So you kind of reduce the pin name. Oh, reduce the pin name. That's kind of the kind of thing. Yeah. And, and in the slide where you talk about the uh, separation of tools, the tools overlap spectrum yes. the software, right? what, what, does, what information do you, does it extract from the reference image? Sorry? Yeah, you said the procedure is first to take a reference image and mm -hmm. then to 
and you take the image with the two dyes and then right. do the calculation. So my question is, how, what kind of information does it extract from the reference image? To do I that? just extract the um, spectrum of the light. Right, so every light is a certain wavelength and spectrum, so the density blocks wide wavelength. So the density is Y and wavelength of X. And depending on the dye that's there, you have different, um, you have different intensity values in that plot. And that is just a plot, it just gives you a curve, and that curve is the reference spectrum. Okay. One more question, sorry. <laughs> and when you're talking about the accurate thing, I, I, I'm not so sure. What's the difference between accurate training and longer exposure time? It seems to me the five frames of accurate training and five times exposure time is just the same for the same. Yes. So you get one, you get the better use of the better use of the because at the same time, it's important to be right, but they can force the difference so there's not too much of a difference. But for instance, if I did have five times longer exposure time and five frames of accurate training, probably the signal should always be. Yeah, this will also be useful. Okay. So then for the questions, thanks again. And in case you have any questions, you're always welcome to join.